Good evening, everyone. This is wonderful. It's so exciting to see you all here. You know, we begin this planning um, many months, even years in advance, so it's exciting. On behalf of the Ignatian Solidarity Network, I'd like to welcome each of you to the Ignatian Family Teaching for Justice. For 21 years, this Ignatian family has gathered to deepen our network's commitment to be people of justice who are motivated to act by our faith. I'm curious to know, how many of you are here at the teaching for the first time? Raise your hands if you're here for the first time. Wow. A lot of you. Well, welcome to, to all those who are joining us for the first time and for becoming part of this Ignatian family. We're, we're so grateful that you're with us. I also want to offer a special welcome to a number of international delegations that are here. Uh, first from the north, I'd like to welcome our delegations from Canada. We, our Canadians, can you stand up, please? Stand up. There they are. There's some. There they are. There they are. Okay. And I think there's more, or maybe even more, too. Um, we also have delegations here from Mexico. Where are our delegations from Mexico? Excellent. I think we have at least one delegate from Spain. Spain. Oh, there we go. Excellent. I know we have one delegate from Nicaragua. Let me see. I know he's in the room somewhere. I saw him. And maybe if we could have any other delegates who are from outside the United States stand and so that we can welcome you, please. Thank you. And we also have some special delegates from El Salvador from the Jesuits University of Central America, the UCA. I'm excited to welcome Carla and Carlos, who deserve, there they are, there they are. They deserve special recognition because the teaching, of course, is grounded in the story of the six Jesuits and Elba and Selena Ramos killed uh, there in El Salvador at the UCA 29 years ago this month. So thank you to each, to both of you for your presence, which helps us to continue to illuminate that story. We're really grateful that you're here. I'm also um, excited to welcome the many delegations from institutions that are sponsored by other Catholic partners outside of, of the Jesuit order of priests and brothers who've come to be uh, with us, who've come with an open heart to explore faith and justice with us in this Ignatian tradition. Thank you to all those universities, high schools, and parishes who are with us, especially those who have come for the first time. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. And I also want to welcome the many people from around the world uh, that have joined us via the live stream provided by our friends at America Media. Thank you. Hello. We're glad you're with us. Um, hi, Mom. Uh, she'll give me a hard time for that. Um, and speaking of saying thanks, I want to thank uh, the ISN staff, our staff, uh, Kim Miller, Kelly Swan, Lena Chape, and Elizabeth Cross, our uh, interns who are students at John Carroll University. We're grateful for all their work. I also want to uh, thank, thank our, yeah, let's give them, they've worked really hard. Let's give them a round of applause. I want to, we have a steering committee of nearly 30 people who help uh, begin in January making all this happen. So we're so grateful for all the work uh, they've done over the past months to prepare for this weekend. Thank you to each of them. Now in your program, you will see a list of sponsors. These are institutions that value the faith and justice mission of the Ignatian Solidarity Network and have committed to partnering with us to put on the teach-in. So I, I want you to take a look, uh, look at that list of sponsors. These include our Xavier-level sponsors, Be the Light Youth Theology Institute at Canisius College. There they are. Commonweal Magazine. Creighton University. The Just Employment Project and Kalmanovitz Initiative for Labor and the Working Poor at Georgetown University. International Samaritan, Villanova University, and Xavier University. We also have some Loyola sponsors. Uh, our friends from Contemplative Rebellion, Ethics Merch, the Jesuit Conference Office of Justice and Ecology, the McGrath Institute for Jesuit Catholic Education at the University of San Francisco, and Sojourners. And our Magis sponsors, America Media, 
Boston College School of Theology and Ministry, the Jesuit School of Theology at Santa Clara University. So thank you to all those sponsors. There are other sponsors that are in the program book as well. We're also grateful to our program advertisers and all those who've helped to generously make this happen. Without this support, uh, we couldn't make the teaching happen. So we, we really, thank you so much. Now, when we first gathered 21 years ago, we did so in a tent on the banks of the Chattahoochee River in Columbus, Georgia. Our location and intention and in gathering was to build on a growing movement of people seeking to call attention to the U.S. role in torturing and killing hundreds of thousands of innocent people throughout Central and South America, including the murders of the El Salvador Uca martyrs that I mentioned earlier, Saint Oscar Romero. Yeah. That sounds very nice, doesn't it? Sisters Dorothy Kazel, Ida Ford, Mara Clark, and laywoman Jean Donovan. It was graduates of a US military school for Latin American soldiers, then known as the School of the Americas, and later renamed the Western Hemisphere Institute for Security Cooperation, that provided training to soldiers who would return to their countries and often become some of the most grievous human rights violators of their time. The founder of the teach-in a gentleman named Bob Holstein, who was a former Jesuit turned lay person and lawyer, was moved by the deaths of the martyrs and inspired to act, seeking to create a way that the Ignatian family could come together at the gates of Fort Benning and call attention to our country's role in the harsh and violent reality of Central America. And look where this tent is today. It's no longer a real tent, of course, uh, stuck in the mud of Western Georgia. Instead, it is a tent of ideas, Thoughts, stories, dreams, hopes, prayers that we are each part of. 2,000 people gathering together to learn, network, pray, and act for justice. And this is just the beginning because now you are part of this Ignatian family for life, joining with tens of thousands of people who stand for justice together through our in-person programs, online campaigns, and much more. You're all part of this Ignatian family, and we're so glad you're here. And of course, we gather at a pivotal time for this country as we reconcile and seek to overcome the realities of racism, xenophobia, mistreatment of our earth that impacts the most vulnerable, marginalization of people because of their gender, sexual identity, or immigration status and many other forms of injustice that degrade the dignity and beauty of human life. As a community of faith this weekend, we will memorialize the lives of the martyrs killed in El Salvador because they were faithful people, as well as the lives of so many others who've been victims, uh, victims of hatred, of violence, and injustice, including those lost, who lost their lives last weekend during the attacks at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, and at the Burnett Chapel Church of Christ in Tennessee. Here at the crossroads, we will make space for pain and for healing, and we will also move forward with the momentum towards justice, beauty, and hope necessary in our shared work to overcome injustice in all its forms. Thank you so much for being part of this journey. Now, let us prepare, prepare to begin our opening prayer. crossroads. What are we to do about the state of the world? All of us have arrived here tonight together. We have come from suburban towns to urban downtowns, high schools, colleges, parishes, and nonprofits. We are newer to the work of justice. We are more seasoned in the tireless fight for human dignity. Many speak English, others speak Spanish, French, Tagalog, and other languages. 
we gather tonight as individuals making up one body and we ask the Holy Spirit to descend upon us our conversations our work together Holy Spirit come and fill this place school student with the ambition to change the world. I bring with me a prayer for unity. I am compelled to work for justice in order to gain equality for all. My faith tells me to stand for what I believe in, even if I am left standing alone. I bring with me the legacy of men and women, people of resiliency, particularly people that have been left out of the goodness, but yet at the same time have kept their hope. I am compelled to work for justice, to be a catalyst for Jesuit education as a faith that does action. And my faith tells me that love has the power to discern that it has the capacity to help us understand, to reconcile, to tell the truth, and to heal all wounds. young educator currently teaching at a Jesuit Lakota Catholic High School, Makapialuta, Ohio, Red Cloud Indian School on Pine Ridge Reservation. I bring the experience of 12 years of Jesuit education, which has given me an invitation to place myself in environments where I struggle, reflect, and grow. I also bring with me the spirit of each one of my students. I'm compelled to work for justice as an educator because I have found that educational spaces are the foundation of justice in our world. And I recognize the potential of each one of my students. My faith tells me to embrace the opportunity that I have to gift my students the joy of learning and the space that helps students come to know themselves and how worthy and loved they are. Spirit. 
first generation Latina college student at Seattle University. I bring with me an openness to learn, to grow, and to be a woman for others. I am, I am compelled to work for justice, to be in solidarity with my brothers and sisters on the verge of being separated from their immigrant parents, and to bring awareness to suffering to those who do not have a voice. My faith tells me to be a light in the darkness. We gather tonight, a community of believers, students, teachers, learners, doers, activists, artists, critical thinkers, justice seekers, and peace builders. In the letter from Paul, we hear this, this spirit's presence is shown some way in each person for the good of all. gathered here today. We raise each other up through our unique differences and richness of race, gender, sexual orientation, and faith. We are all here to make a difference in today's world. I pray that our voices be heard as we strive to be the, to be the change we wish to see. As Jesuit educated students, we pray that our voices will be heard as we lift them up in this space of prayer. Our government. May our leaders respond to the needs of their communities with generosity, with graciousness, and openness. May policymakers put the most disenfranchised at the center of their strategies so that an equitable exchange of goods, privileges, rights, and responsibilities may be enjoyed by all. Holy Spirit, come fill this I pray for educators, faculty, staff, and students of the schools present, that we have our eyes, ears, and hearts open to the grace of this weekend, and that we recognize that the schools we return home to can be spaces to continue the conversations from this weekend. We pray for the intercession of Ignacio Eacria, who reminds us that academic institutions are inescapably a social force. They must transform and enlighten the society in which they live. And finally, I pray for teachers that they continue to recognize the responsibility to see the inherent worth and potential in each of their students and inspire students to be advocates for change in our world. Holy Spirit, come fill this place. pray for freedom and liberation of all peoples, for those who are incarcerated, 
to those who may never cross paths with our criminal justice system. We pray for peoples who continue to be oppressed, marginalized, shunned, and unjustly excluded. Free us, O oh God, from the temptation to live our lives over people. Help us offer freedom and life to all. Compassionate God, you call us to yourself and to one another. Remind us this weekend how we are asked to follow your ways in this broken world. Grant us perseverance to stay the course of justice and truth while growing in compassion for each person beside us. Strengthen our resolve to truly encounter one another with an intention of peace and curiosity. Grant us the courage to reach out, especially when we feel we are the ones who need to be reached out to. Help us step out, step up, and allow the Holy Spirit to work. Holy Spirit, come fill this place. Good evening. My name is Dr. Mary Wardell Garaduzzi, and I'm a Vice Provost and Chief Diversity Officer at the University of San Francisco. I also teach in the School of Education, um, where right now the course I'm teaching is Race and Diversity in Higher Education. I'd like to open up this evening and this engagement that we have with some thoughts that I'd like to share with you. The intersection of discipleship and division and the notion of mutuality. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. This week, I lost my mother. She was a beautiful woman, a black girl, a young woman who was born and grew up in the segregated South in rural central Arkansas. She and my father, who was from Eastern Texas, Texarkana specifically, both of whom have lived through and seen the effect of Jim Crow policy that legally excluded African Americans from fully participating in the life and the prosperity of the United States were anxious to leave that state form of terrorism behind. You see, they both sought a better life for themselves and eventually their future children. Their siblings also left, and most of them went north, but my parents came out west to California. That movement, an exodus of six million people who left the southern states over the course of five to six decades was called the Great Migration. I am standing here today as a leader in Jesuit higher education and as a living testament to their commitment and their courage as social and political refugees in their own country at that time, so that they too might be afforded the opportunity to, and to embrace and live out the promises of America. My mother's story, as a woman who passes away in her 80s on Monday, her story intersects, is interconnected, and has direct mutuality to the stories of our brothers and sisters in Central America in the caravan right now, who are seeking a better life for their family, themselves, and their children. It intersects to the exclusion of transgender people in our communities, 
who are seeking the rights and privileges and thereunto that's afforded to them, that should be afforded to them. It's connected to the violence we saw, as Chris said earlier, the anti-Semitism in Pittsburgh and Charlottesville and the other spaces we continue to see things happen. Over the next few days, my job here today is to what they call break open this event, this time we have together. And I want to prepare you to engage in a very high capacity social justice, teaching and learning, exchange and engagement. So your role over the next few days is to be great students, to be great learners. Your job is to listen generously, to open your heart and your mind to new thinking and new ideas that might be disruptive. I want you to engage your moral imagination of what could be and not to get stuck in the place of what has been and what things are at the moment. Many of you may hear ideas that are different than the ones you hear at home. Or perhaps if that's not the case, you will hear and grow in ways that you've never heard before. Now I'm going to be quite frank here. What's happening here, particularly for you first timers, is that you are being charged with the audacity to believe that peoples everywhere have a right to housing, have a right to three meals a day for their body, have a right to education, have a right to health care, and should have be able to engage in the culture for their minds as full human beings that are loved and beloved by their God to equality and the freedom of their spirits. Although I will be returning home early, I won't be able to be with you for the, for the whole weekend. As we prepare, my sisters, my, my mother's siblings are traveling from all over the country, the ones that can, cousins, for her formal burial and homegoing later on next week. But I stand here today to, other, to honor my mother's life, her spirit, and her freedom all of which are very much alive in me and the work that is happening at this place and at this time. Yet I'm here to also, also caution you that the legacy that she has left behind as, as well as so many other social justice workers is at risk of threat. I wanna make it plain to you what our theme of discipleship at the crossroads means. And I want to offer it through the lens of intersectionality and what that means at this unique time of societal division and the notion of mutuality that Martin Luther King talked about in 1963. You see, my duty today is to her life and memory and to ensure that her courageous actions have not been and were not in vain. My mother's story and her freedom intersects and is mutually conditional to the freedom of the migrants everywhere, to the freedom of undocumented students on our campuses and in our communities, to the freedom of transgender and LGBTQ students and their rights and full inclusion, to the freedom of students of color who have been historically underrepresented and continue to be marginalized in society and oftentimes on our campuses to the free freedom of the people of religious orders and the people of faith everywhere who seek to assemble and serve God in peace and solidarity. I am here today because there is no other place for me to be than to be here with you to proclaim the witness of her life. Now you are here today, Ignatian students, because you have been called to proclaim the witness of the marginalized and to do something about it. So I implore you today to answer the call into a higher vision of your life. Your life from this moment on can no longer be about yourself. Answer the calling to a higher understanding of humanity, 
and learn what it means to care for others and what that means when we talk about the common good. You are being called to a higher engagement of love. Not just a love for the people that you like, but we're gonna to have to learn to love people that are not easily lovable in order to do this work of justice. This Ignatian family teaching is the largest social justice class you have ever been involved in, and the largest social justice class in the world. So I implore you as an educator and, a, and as a vice provost, be a good student. Listen carefully. Ask thoughtful questions that not only contribute to your own learning, but to the learnings of those around you. Be open. And in our Ignatian tradition, make sure you reflect individually as well as in community on what you have learned and what choices you will make when you leave this weekend. God bless you. Thank you, Dr. Werdell, for breaking open our theme and challenging us to more. Now we will hear from our first group of Ignatian Network speakers. Before we hear from them, though, we have a lot of folks standing in the back. So if you could kind of squeeze in and make some space if you have any space in the middle. There's also some space in the front up here on both sides. Thank you for that. Our first three Ignatian Network speakers um, are, our, our first Ignatian Network speaker is Ayari Moore from Xavier University. Her talk is titled, To Journey Together, We Must First Journey Separately. Then we'll hear from Elizabeth Fahey from Holy Redeemer Parish. Her talk is entitled, God's Inclusive Love Proclaimed Here. And our final speaker is Sasha Williams from Cardinet High School, who, whose talk is titled, Justice for Nia, She Could Have Been One of Us. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ayari. I'm a senior at Xavier University. <laughs> so this theme for this year is how can we take a journey together as an intersection of communities? But today I would talk to you about how we must first journey separately. During a Dorothy Day immersions trip to St. Louis, we met with Pastor Tracy Blackman. She said something that resonated with me. She said, in order for us to address racism, we can't just work together as black and whites collectively. But the black community has to focus on issues in the black community, and the white community has to focus on issues in the white community. What she said didn't make sense to me at first, but I've had time to reflect over her statement, and so I will share my interpretation. I grew up in the west suburbs of Chicago, where all my neighbors were middle class white families. In school, I was usually the only black kid in my class. I graduated with six black class, classmates out of 502 students total. I knew that I didn't quite fit in, but I tried the best that I could. I knew that I was black, but I didn't know what that meant. It wasn't the case that I didn't know the richness of my culture or my people. I just didn't know myself. So I've immersed myself in my blackness, and in doing so, I gained self-love. A critical starting point for the black community is for us to regain our self-love. So I've written a love letter to my community. Dear brothers and sisters, we have to start loving ourselves again. We have to find our purpose and our passion to fight for what is right and stop being distracted by celebrity drama. <laughs> we need to pay attention. 
But most importantly, we need to stop feeling sorry for ourselves. We can't be upset for five minutes and expect change. If you're unhappy with the way that we are treated in this country, then get up and do something about it consistently. It doesn't matter if you're light skin, dark skin, brown skin, stop competing with one another. Competing with each other has gotten us absolutely nowhere. Change begins in the masses. And until black people realize that, we will get nowhere. We have to be able to break ourselves down to the bare minimum, hit rock bottom, and we either accept the way that things are or we change them. A friend asked me, why are you criticizing your own people? Because I realized I loved myself and my people too much to sit back and let things continue on the way that they are. Now, a year ago, I would have never done a speech like this or even thought it the way I think now. But I've immersed myself in my blackness, and in doing so, I have gained my self-love, and I have loved every second of it. I am willing, by any means necessary, to bring my people up and out of our situation. In the words of Angela Davis, I am no longer accepting things I cannot change. I am changing things I cannot accept. Because if the black community doesn't do for itself, no one else is going to do it for us. Love your sister. For my brothers and sisters in the white community, I can only give suggestions and advice. For a person of color, talking about racism is exhausting. <laughs> it's time the white community do some legwork. I've had many of my white friends ask me, <laughs> hey Ari, I really want to talk about racism in our country. I just don't know how. My answer is to educate yourself and your friends and your families and be able to understand why we kneel during the national anthem. <laughs> it starts by reading a book, watching a documentary about slavery, Jim Crow, the new Jim Crow, mass incarceration, and critically analyze the issue. Then, Take what you've learned, share with others, and start a meaningful discussion. Have those uncomfortable conversations about racism at Thanksgiving, Christmas dinner, with your families, but most importantly, have those conversations sitting at the lunch table, on the bus, or while you're walking home from that basketball game with your friends and classmates. But also, educate yourself on the richness of black culture our resiliency, food, clothing, hairstyles, music, and dances, just to name a few. I want to encourage all of you to engage in conversations and relationships with all types of cultures and populations of people in the community. Get out of your comfort zone and seek to understand that thing, culture, or that person. Always ask questions, even if it means putting yourself in those uncomfortable situations. Staying comfortable and not acting keeps you complacent to the issues that plague our nation. The only way we can be authentic in our fight for social justice and be able to take this journey together is when we become authentic within ourselves and in our own communities. Don't ever be afraid to make mistakes. No one said it was gonna be easy and it's definitely not going to be. There are always going to be spaces for blacks and whites to come together, such as having programs like Dorothy Day Immersions and IFTJ and other cultural events at your schools and universities. But when we have these conversations, they must be open, non-judgmental, and we must actively listen to those who are marginalized, because not just one voice speaks for everyone. Listen to that person, but most importantly, hear what they're saying. I'm no expert. I have a lot of growing up to you, just like the rest of you in this room. I have to continue to accept myself and others around me. I don't have all the answers, but what I do know is that true love and change starts with you. I want to leave you knowing the power that you have to change yourself and the world around you. My personal philosophy is this. We can never walk in 
We can never fully walk in one another's shoes, but when someone hands you their shoe, take the time to appreciate the journey that that shoe has taken. Appreciate the shoe and love the foot that it fits. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Hi. <laughs> My name is Lizzie Fahey, and I'm a second year Master of Divinity student at the Jesuit School of Theology in Berkeley. As a part of my degree program, I was asked to pick a field education site where I would work in ministry about 10 hours a week for the entirety of my second year. I was thrilled to make the choice to serve at Most Holy Redeemer Parish in San Francisco, a little parish in the Castro doing big things. A few weeks ago, some of the young adults from MHR gathered in a cramped San Francisco apartment after mass to celebrate the Mid-Autumn Harvest Festival at the invitation of a member of our group. I sat on the floor and chatted with a young man who was new to our group. He spoke of his friend, another member of the young adults, and said, Brian is the first person that I met who made me realize I didn't have to choose, that I could be gay and a part of a parish that loves me. I've been Catholic my whole life, and it took me this long to know that I didn't have to choose. This is a crossroads that queer Christians find themselves at too often, an emotionally exhausting and frustrating conflict at which I've encountered students, friends, and coworkers too many times. Today, I would like to share with you the ways that Most Holy Redeemer Catholic Church has and continues to offer a way forward a way in which people are invited to come as they are to their faith community and welcome in the body of Christ in the fullness of their identity. First, some history. Due to white flight in the 1950s, there was a large amount of open real estate in the Castro District of San Francisco. Many members of the gay community moved to the Castro in the late 1960s and early 1970s. Harvey Milk arrived in the Castro in 1973, and through his activism, further solidified the Castro's reputation as a queer haven. In the 1980s, MHR was assigned a new pastor, Father McGuire, who specifically set out to engage with the changing demographics of the neighborhood. What did this look like? Well, according to one parishioner, this meant that a priest and his clerics and a habitless nun would hit the gay bars, grab a drink, join the conversation, and invite the folks they met there to mass. and people started showing up. When the AIDS epidemic hit the Castro in the 1980s, Most Holy Redeemer responded. In 1985, the parish started an AIDS support group and later that year opened Coming Home Hospice, the first hospice center in the world dedicated specifically to patients with AIDS. To this day, the AIDS support group at MHR continues and the group and its mission has grown and changed over the years as the needs of those affected by HIV AIDS have changed. In 2015, the National Catholic Reporter estimated that members of the LGBTQ community make up 80% of Most Holy Redeemer Parish. In this, in this spirit and mission of radical hospitality and acceptance, MHR works tirelessly to be more inclusive of women, trans folk, and people of color recognizing that our parish can always do more and better at creating space in our community and at the table for people who are marginalized. Today, when I walk into Mass on Sundays, I see this displayed in our marvelously diverse and vibrant parish. Most Holy Redeemer stands as a way forward for all those who stand at the crossroads of their faith and sexuality and offers a place for them to integrate the two. The parish boldly invites all to come as they are confirming that all are truly welcome here and lives by its motto of God's inclusive love proclaimed here. At my first young adult group meeting, I got to hear the history of the parish from the perspective of a layman who joined the parish in 1981. He invited us to meditate on the image of the most holy redeemer. 
the Holy One who compensates for the faults of others and who regains through payment possession of that or those who have been taken. For me, I see a clear connection between the name and the way Most Holy Redeemer Parish seeks to regain God's children who have been cast out from their faith communities and the ways that the parish heals the hurts done by other faith leaders and groups. As a whole, the Catholic Church has a lot of work to do to compensate for the faults of its past and present. There is so much in the church that seeks to be redeemed. Most Holy Redeemer is doing its small part to help in that effort. My hope for all of us is that we can be members of a church that never makes us feel as if we would have to choose between our sexuality or any other part of ourselves that makes us who we are and our faith. My hope is that we can be a church that means it when we say that all are welcome here. A church... Let us be a church that radically proclaims God's inclusive love. Thank you. Once upon a time in a faraway kingdom known as California, <laughs> a little girl was asked a simple question. What drives you to do social justice? Ever since then, something sparked inside of her, not only to make an effort to fight for herself, but to fight for others. Hi, my name is Sasha Williams, and like most of us, I'm an advocator, listener, disciple, and student fighting for justice in my community. But what does it mean to fight for social justice? I believe what allows us to fight, to advocate, and to be an ally for others is a drive inside each of us. And when one is asked the question, what drives you to do social justice, everyone's answer is always different. For some people, it's a personal experience of injustice. For others, it's an example of family members or role models. And for most of us, it's a feeling of moral responsibility as a child of God. No matter how you tell your story, each reveals the true reason why we fight and do what we do. I believe my story is driven by my environment and personal experiences of being raised in a both white and black community. At the early age of eight, my parents sat down and gave me the talk. No, not the classic birds and bees talk but the talk and understanding what it means to be black in America, especially for me as a young black girl who lived and went to school in an all white community, but spend most of my free time and did most of my activities and sports in an all black community. As I grew up navigating these communities, I started to realize the challenges of what it truly means to be a black woman in America. For a long time, black women have been pushed down to believe to be the double negative. By that, I mean facing problems both as a woman and as African Americans. In my own personal experiences and seeing the pressures of being a black woman and also seeing close family members and friends, I developed a passion and a drive. Throughout my teenage years, I continued to advocate for the needs and resources of young girls of color. And I thought I was doing everything right. I thought I was speaking out. I thought I was creating policies until one summer day. On July 22nd of 2018, three African-American sisters, Nia, Latifah, and Tasha Wilson walked onto BART, or the Bay Area Rapid Transit, the local public transportation system connecting both the urban and suburban areas of the Bay. It was a late afternoon and like thousands of other commuters, these three girls were on their way home after a long and busy day. As they got off the train station at MacArthur in Oakland, they were brutally attacked. One sister was stabbed and suffered critical injuries, while another sister, 18-year-old Nia Wilson, 
was slashed at the throat and murdered by self-identified white supremacists. On that very same day, my close friend Gabby and I were walking in downtown Oakland, getting off at the 19th Street BART station, just one station over from MacArthur. The next day when Gabby and I found out what happened to Nia and her two sisters, we were completely devastated. And to be honest, we were also enraged. We thought how it could have been one of us or how it could have been any other of our black girlfriends continuously writing BART. Personally, I felt a sense of hopelessness, that all the hard work that I have done fighting for social justice and all the hard work that my fellow black sisters have done had been for nothing. The man who killed Nia Wilson killed her for the color of her skin, something that we cannot change, something that I do not want to change. How can I advocate for the needs and resources of young girls of color if those very same girls' lives I'm fighting for are not valued enough to be protected in our very own communities? So that day, we decided to take action. We decided to create a campaign honoring Nia Wilson and her family. With the permission and blessing of the Nia Wilson family, we created the She Could Have Been One of Us t-shirt campaign. Our slogan, she could have been one of us, means that any of us, another black girl or woman, could have been in Nia's place, having her life taken away from her. We also show this through our logo, purposely not putting a face on the black girl, meaning that she is all of us. In making these t-shirts and sweatshirts, our goal over this one year campaign is to raise $5,000 with all the money going straight to the Nia Wilson family. But that is not our only goal. By working with various organizations and schools like Gabby and mine, we want to prove the idea and the importance of and the quality of life of young black girls everywhere. This is why we also put Black Girls Lives Matter on the back of the t-shirts to bring attention to the violence perpetrated against young black women and black girls. What we want and what Nia's family wants is justice for Nia and for her legacy, as well as justice for her sister and for our community's loss. That is why with this campaign, we also wanna bring awareness to the discrimination that young black girls experience on an everyday basis. Like writing your so like riding your local transportation. This is not just a race issue. And this is not just a gender issue either. This is a human rights issue. As young student advocates, we need to share and tell the stories of what happens in our communities. Social justice and social advocacy is nothing without recognizing that we are all connected human beings. We all have complex stories and lives in trying to create a better world with dignity and freedom. This conference brings students, teachers, and so many others from different places and communities. And because of this, we all have different stories that we want to share and different stories that we want to fight justice for. My drive and my story led me to develop a passion for fighting for young black women and now fighting for the safety of young black girls. Because of this, it allows me not only to share my story, but to share Nia's story as well. And in the words of my partner, Gabby, the Nia Wilson campaign represents elevating the voices of young girls of color. Too often, our voices and stories go unheard. Wearing these t-shirts and shirts represents unity, solidarity, and hopes that we can push our country in the direction for a better tomorrow. But just because we all come from different roads doesn't mean we can't listen, share ideas, come together, move apart, and fight for each other's causes and issues. For me and my partner Gabby, we wanna fight for Nia and for the safety of young black girls everywhere. Gabby and I invite you to follow our Instagram, become a sponsor, donate, and most importantly, buy a shirt. No matter what race you are or where you come from, we believe that everyone can proudly wear our shirts. 
as well as support the campaign and support the meaning of what it means to have a life and what a meaning of what it means to be a black girl. Here at this conference, I invite everyone from all different roads, not to only help us further our campaign, but to move forward towards justice, beauty, and hope in all of our communities. But it starts with you. One thing that I urge you to take away from my speech tonight is what drives you to do social justice. That's why we're all here today. By finding that drive, by understanding why you're here, why you wanna fight for others, it will lead you to a place and to a moment where you have never fought before. Thank you. very much for all that wisdom. So um, as a Chicano, I want to offer a tribute, a song that I learned in the road of justice work. I want to offer as a Chicano this song that I learned from the African American community because African community, African American community is teacher not just these areas that racist society wants to put it in of entertainment or this or the other thing. Offer this. So today I want to focus with you guys a song that I learned and I've been doing as a Chicano as a tribute because we learned it in the process of understanding the Underground Railroad. And this was a code song. We've sung it here all the time. Every year we sing it. It's a code song when people, not slaves, that's an adjective, when people who were enslaved by a capitalist endeavor called slavery um, were fighting for their freedom, were organizing in many ways. And I adapted because we learned and we created a a version of the Underground Railroad called Sanctuary Movement. And we've continued in that space. So it's taken from the book of Isaiah. It's a song that you all know called Wait in the Water. Wait in the Water, children. Wait, wait in the Water. God's going to trouble the water. God's going to trouble the water. Together now. Wait in the water. Well, wait in the water, children. Wait in the water. God's going to trouble the water. Well, God's going to trouble the water. Now who? That young is dressed in red. God, Lord, my must be the children Elijah led. God's gonna trouble the water. Whoa. Wait in the water. Wait in the water, children. You know what happens at the border? They got this infrared light and cameras, and they try to scare people by showing all these people crossing the border, and they all look white in the infrared light. So I had to change a little bit of the lyrics going. Now who that young dressed in white? 
mind's gone dry. My mind beat the children that cross in the night. I Together now, wait in the water, wait in the water, children, wait in the water, God's going to trouble the water, Whoa. God's going to trouble the water. Now who that on the dressed in black, God's going to trouble the water. Our people and we ain't turning back. God's going to trouble the wall. Together, wait. Wait in the water, children. Wait in the water. God's going to trouble the water. God's going to trouble the water. trouble the water It is my honor to introduce our first keynote speaker of the teach-in, Bishop George V. Murray of the Society of Jesus. Bishop Murray grew up in Camden, New Jersey after graduating from Catholic elementary school and Catholic high school. He attended St. Joseph's College in Philadelphia St. Thomas Seminary in Connecticut, and St. Mary's Seminary in Baltimore. In 1972, he entered the Society of Jesus and was ordained on June 9, 1979. He earned a Master's of Divinity from the Jesuit School of Theology in Berkeley in 1979 and a Doctorate in American Cultural History from George Washington University in Washington, D.C. in 1994. Bishop Murray has served on the faculty and as Dean of Student Activities at Gonzaga College High School in Washington, D.C., as Assistant Professor of American Studies at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., as president of Archbishop Carroll High School in Washington, D.C., and as vice president for academic affairs at the University of Detroit Mercy. Bishop Murray has served on numerous boards, including St. Joseph's University, the University of Detroit, Fairfield University, and Walsh University. Bishop Murray has served as Bishop of the Diocese of Youngstown since 2007. He is a member of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops and has served as Secretary of the Conference as Chairman of the Committee on Priorities and Plans and served as Chairman of the Committee Against Racism. He also has served as a member of the Board of Directors of Catholic Relief Services. Bishop Murray is a prophetic voice in the church, constantly pushing her to more deeply live and fulfill its mission. Please welcome Bishop George Murray. Thank you very much and good evening. I am delighted to be with you 
this evening because of two things. First of all, because of you. To see so many of you who are dedicated to social justice, we're caring for the poor and the needy, for caring for those who are pushed off to the margins, as Pope Francis talks about, and to hear your enthusiasm and your hope for the future is something which I will carry back to Ohio tomorrow, and I will tell people about the opportunity of being with you. The second reason I'm happy to be here is because we need to have an adult conversation about a very difficult issue, the issue of racism, an issue which has persisted in our society and unfortunately has persisted in our church. And as we go forward, we have to come together to overcome this parasite of society. Nearly 30 years ago, a Catholic organization sponsored a conference entitled Voices of Justice, the challenge of being Catholic and American in the 1980s. One of the keynote speakers was Union Theological Seminary professor and author James Cone, who unfortunately died last April. He issued a theological challenge to the Catholic Church. He said this, what is it about the Catholic definition of justice that makes many persons of that faith progressive in their attitude towards the poor in Central America, but reactionary in their views towards the poor in black America. <laughs> Cohn goes on to say, it is the failure of the Catholic Church to deal effectively with the problem of racism that causes me to question the quality of its commitment to justice. I do not wish to minimize the importance of Catholic contributions to poor people's struggle for justice, but I must point out the ambiguity of the Catholic stand on justice when racism is not addressed forthrightly. Cohn's reservations concerning the adequacy and effectiveness of American Catholic reflection on racism, as directed, in his words, towards African Americans, but as also seen by other groups of color, has also been expressed by official voices within the American Catholic Church. In 1989, the U.S. Bishops Committee on Black Catholics issued a statement commemorating the 10th anniversary of the Bishop's Conference only pastoral letter concerning racism. It was entitled Brothers and Sisters to Us. Sadly, this anniversary committee found little worth celebrating. It concluded that, quote, the promulgation of the pastoral letter on racism was soon forgotten by all but a few. A survey revealed a pathetic, anemic response from archdioceses and dioceses across the country. The pastoral letter on racism had made little or no impact on the majority of Catholics in the United States. In spite of what has been said and written about racism, very little, if anything at all, has been done. Such it was yesterday, it is today. End quote. More recently, in 2004, 25 years after the pastoral letter, Brothers and Sisters to Us, the U.S. Bishops commissioned a study to discern its implementation and reflection. The commission paints a rather disheartening picture of the church's relationship with the black community. For example, since Brothers and Sisters to Us was issued, very few statements were issued condemning racism or, sta or stating that it was in fact sinful. Rather, 
the statements that were issued address personal attitudes of direct racial malice. In addition, the commission notes that many diocesan seminaries and ministry formation programs are inadequate in terms of their incorporation of the history, culture, and traditions of the black community. Most disturbing is the commission's report that white Catholics over the last 25 years have exhibited diminished rather than increased support for government policies aimed at curbing racial inequality. Of these official reflections, the significant lack of, comp of compliance of the American church with its own recommendations contained in brothers and sisters to us is extremely disturbing. While racism is America's most persistent sin, it appears that the American Catholic Church has continued to be virtually silent about its significance in seminaries, churches, and every other segment of the larger church community in America. Which leads to the question, why? What is the place of race in the Catholic imagination? And how can we begin to actually confront racism so that there is change in our community? Let's begin first with a definition of racism. If you ask someone what racism is, <clears throat> you will get a huge number of definitions. The one that I have found most effective is this. Racism is race prejudice plus power. It begins with that sense of race prejudice, that somehow one race is better than another. If you add to that power, political, social, psychological, whatever, you have racism. And racism can easily become institutionalized as we see in our country. Most expressions of racism, at least racism directed at African Americans, <clears throat> can be traced directly back to our country's involvement with the transatlantic slave trade during colonial times. Therefore, it would be prudent for us to begin our investigation at that point in American history. But in order to set the stage for the American experience, we need to briefly examine the attitudes of the church as it grew in its foundations in the first century. The issue of slavery is one that historically has been treated with concern within the Catholic Church. After the recognition of Christianity within the Roman Empire, there was a growing sentiment that many kinds of slavery were not compatible with Christian conceptions of charity and justice. Some argued against all forms of slavery, while other argue, others argued the case for slavery subject to certain conditions. Initially, church teachings made a distinction between what was called just and unjust forms of slavery. Unjust forms of slavery involved enslaving those who were baptized. Just forms of slavery involved enslaving those who were not. Over time, abject slavery diminished in Christian Europe but it was often replaced with a form of indentured servitude, which in some circumstances could be just as self-destructive as slavery. But with the advent of European imperialism into the African continent, slavery again came to the fore. In response to the enslavement of people of color, Pope Eugene IV authored a papal bull in 1435, addressed to a bishop in Portugal, he condemned the enslavement of the indigenous people who had converted to the faith. Consequently, he commanded that all, within the space of 15 days of the publication of this letter, be restored to their earlier liberty. 
This directive, the Pope said, was issued under pain of excommunication. So he was being very serious about it. A century later, as Europe expanded into the Americas, the church once again responded to the evil of slavery. This time it was Pope Paul III. However, he presents a slightly different understanding of slavery. Paul III was not concerned about articulating a meaning of just or unjust slavery. Rather, he asserted that whomever is endowed with the capability to receive the faith of Christ and welcomes his gospel, baptized or not, should by no means be deprived of their liberty or the possession of their property. This clearly was an advancement in the church's position on slavery and as such created some apprehension among Catholic colonists in North America. Apprehension, yes. Thoughts of abolition, no. The reason was that as the colonies began to expand, so did the institution of slavery, at least in the South. Thus, for many, slavery had become so entrenched in the fabric of the colonies that its complete abolition was considered an unrealistic concept. In 1839, Pope Gregory issued another papal document on slavery that condemned the slave trade in the strongest possible terms. However, Gregory's letter did not end the slave trade in the United States, but it did at least produce a debate in the Catholic community. The Catholic population of the United States, which had grown from 35,000 in 1790 to 195,000 in 1820, and then ballooned to 1.6 million by the time of Gregory's apostolic letter, made Catholicism the country's largest single religion in the 19th century. As Catholic ranks swelled, <clears throat> many as a result of, uh, mainly as a result of immigration, arguments raged over exactly what Gregory's letter taught about, uh, about slavery. Some put forward the case that the church opposed any and all forms of slavery while other American leaders sought to interpret the apostolic letter in the narrowest possible fashion in order to minimize its significance. Sad to say, many bishops in the South were slave owners. For some of them, slavery was not simply an institution that had to be endured, but instead it was a blessing for black people. For example, four months after the beginning of the Civil War, one bishop from Louisiana wrote a pastoral letter to his flock in which he said, quote, the manifest will of God is that in exchange for their freedom, of which they are incapable, and for a labor of the whole life, we should give to these unfortunate ones their legitimate portion of the truth and the goods of grace which console them in their present ministries, minis present miseries. Considered from this point of view, slavery was really not an evil at all, but rather a means of a degraded class bettering itself. Moreover, the bishop argued that slavery was an eminently Christian work because it led to the redemption of millions of souls. Now, here it is important to point out that this negative attitude toward blacks in the Catholic community was not unique to the South. Even in the North, the sentiments of the Catholic laity, most of whom, as I mentioned, were recent immigrants, was decidedly anti-black. In the years leading up to and during the Civil War, and even after the destruction of institutional slavery following the Civil War, there were few white Catholics who really believed that blacks were equal to whites. Just as their Protestant contemporaries, white Catholics bore an assumption of black inferiority. Despite these negative notions, there was always a remnant of Catholics that worked diligently to advance race relations in the United States. 
One individual who was responsible for such an effort was a gentleman by the name of Daniel Rudd. By the end of the 19th century, Rudd had made himself known to both clergy and laity as the leading Catholic representative of the black race. In his newspaper, the American Catholic Tribune, Rudd wrote, quote, the Catholic Church alone can break the color line. Our people should help her to do it, end quote. With this sentiment, Rudd developed the idea of a National Congress of African American Catholics. The first black lay Catholic Congress took place in January of 1889. The delegates, numbering over 200, made appeals to labor unions, factory owners, and trade unions to admit black men to their ranks. They spoke of children and the need for orphanages, hospitals, and Catholic schools. Subsequent black congresses stressed the church's need to preserve the deposit of faith regarding the equality of all peoples before God. The meetings consistently reminded the leaders of the church of the mission to announce love in place of hate and to raise up the downtrodden and proclaim the essential value of every human being. The National Black Catholic Congress continues to this day, and the most recent one was held in Florida a year and a half ago. Along with the Black Lay Congress in 1909, another important black Catholic movement began in Mobile, Alabama. Through <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you for Mobile. <laughs> Through the initiative of several pastors of the Josephite order, the Knights of Peter Claver were founded to be a national association of black men to foster fellowship and bring about a spiritual awareness and interest in Catholic church tradition. In 1922, a ladies auxiliary was instituted into the organization. These organizations, the Knights and Ladies of Peter Claver, became important elements in the religious life of black Catholics. Many members worked on issues of civil rights and collaborated with organizations such as the NAACP and the National Urban League. Fortunately, there were Catholics who refused to accept segregation and its consequences. The Southeast Regional Interracial Commission, founded in 1948 by students at Loyola Xavier University, held interracial masses at college campuses. The Commission on Human Rights, organized in 1949, held interracial masses and sent petitions to church officials demanding immigration in southern parishes. And both of those organizations were started by people such as yourselves, by young people who wanted to take action. These were hopeful signs, but still, most Catholic parishes remained segregated along racial lines during the first half of the 20th century. Some dioceses created separate parishes for blacks, while in other areas, blacks could attend any Catholic church, but often had to sit in the rear of the church or in the balcony and were unable to receive communion until every white parishioner had already received. Some parishes even placed screens between the seating area of blacks and whites. Moving forward in history, the Catholic Church's role during segregation and the civil rights movement was at best ambiguous. Suffice it to say here that there were many Catholic leaders, including bishops, priests, religious women in full habits, university presidents, and others who risked their lives to support the cause of racial justice. But in the judgment of most historians, they were the exception to the rule. For the most part, the Catholic Church and its rank and file members remained on the sidelines and watched from afar. After the civil rights movement, undoubtedly, some progress was made. But how far have we truly come? When considering the history of race, 
and the Catholic Church. One cannot help but wonder why in the United States there has been so little social consciousness among Catholics about the problem of racism. As the global church has championed human dignity and equality, it appears that the church in America has been incapable of taking decisive action and enunciating clear principles regarding racism that has led to a change of attitude. Along with their Protestant brothers and sisters, American Catholics have shown a lack of moral consciousness on the issue of race. Clearly at times, our faith has influenced our racial attitude. But negative events in our country which have targeted not only African Americans, but also Latino Americans, Native Americans, Asian Americans, Jews, and immigrants, primarily on the basis of race, forces us to realize that the discussion on equality must run much deeper if we are to be true to the principles on which our country was founded and the principles on which our faith is based. Where then is the way forward? In his letter to the Ephesians, St. Paul tells us that Jesus is our peace. It is by means of his shed blood and broken body that the dividing walls of enmity have been demolished. Today, the Catholic Church in America must recognize that Christ wishes to break down the walls created by the evil of racism. Whether this evil is displayed publicly for all to see or deeply buried in the recesses of our hearts. If not, we are destined for history to continue to repeat itself and once again the church will be perceived as a silent observer in the face of racism. On August 23rd of last year, Cardinal Daniel DiNardo, President of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, established a committee against racism. It is the first time in the history of the conference that this has ever been created. The committee focuses on addressing the sin of racism and in our, in our society and in the church and the urgent need to come together as a nation to find solutions. While I realize that the task appears overwhelming, the bishops are committed to the goal of helping the church become a consistent and productive voice in eradicating this plague. Nearly 40 years ago, brothers and sisters to us asserted that racism is a sin, a sin that divides the human family and violates the fundamental human dignity of those called to be children of the same father. The bishops and lay members of the Committee Against Racism have the opportunity now to listen to the needs of individuals who have suffered from racism through meetings that they have had throughout the country. We will have the opportunity to bring together members of the black community, Latino community, Asian community, Native American community, and all people of different races to bring them to one table to work together to find solutions to this epidemic of hate that has plagued our nation for far too long. Through listening, prayer, and meaningful collaboration, I believe we can find those lasting solutions that we need and the common ground where racism will no longer find a place of rest in our hearts or in our society. One initial effort was the calling of an ecumenical gathering of religious leaders across the board, not just Catholics, not just Christians, religious leaders who believe in values to frankly talk about this problem. This occurred in Washington last April and was very successful. At the same time, the committee is working on a pastoral letter and that pastoral letter will be followed by a conversation on race in Catholic institutions across this country, in schools, in seminaries, in Catholic charities organizations, in Catholic health organizations, and social service organizations. 
The goal will be not only to listen, but to educate and act in order to change hearts, which will lead to a change of attitude. We also must realize that personal interaction is extremely important. It is extremely important to make an effort to know someone of a different race, to listen to their story, to walk in their shoes, as we heard earlier, then to use the gifts that you have been given, especially through the Jesuit and other schools that you have gone to, to offer people on the margins opportunity. The great gift of going to a good school is that you learn so much, and then you have to decide what you're going to do with it. If you hold your gifts to yourself, they will atrophy and die. But you have the opportunity to open the doors of opportunity to others who are left aside. And you can make a difference in their lives, but you have to know them. You have to push back the walls of fear and go out to people who are different, who don't look like you, who don't talk like you, and bring them in, but also allow them to bring you in to their world. In 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 imitation of Christ, the church's actions and teachings must unite us in an indivisible way by means of fostering a beloved community. In imitation of Christ, we, the church, must be willing to give over our lives to the liberation of all men and women by defending the dignity and fundamental rights of every human being. In imitation of Christ, we must not fear to denounce racism and call for equality. If race in the Catholic imagination is to exemplify the love of Christ, it must move forward with the realization that no one, no one, and enter fully into communion with the Lord if one's relationship to the other is marked by indifference or oppression. One can become one with others only if we speak the truth of our sinful past, asking and granting forgiveness, and reaching out to one another in a spirit of reconciliation solidarity, and love. <laughs> Together, my brothers and sisters, we must break the silent complicity with the social evil of racism that has marred the past and continues to mar the present reality of America. Therefore, with trust in the Holy Spirit and rooted in the courage of the saints who have lived lives of a heroic virtue, we must live that same heroic virtue and see equality in the eyes of every human being. Let us begin to see every human being as created in the image and likeness of God and leave behind the learned attitudes of superiority and fear. Thank you.
Thank you, Bishop Murray, for leading us in that very important conversation about racism in our church and in our country. We have a lot to unpack, so we'll take a break until about 8.20, until the first breakout sessions um, start. But before then, we have a few announcements. Please take all your belongings so the hotel staff can flip this room. Um, it turns in, this, this is where our breakout sessions will be held. Um, there are two changes in location, so you can find in your, in your program guides on page 4.